Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome on behalf of the Netherlands Atlantic Association. Today we discuss the leadership of the United States on the global stage with a very special guest. He is the former commander of the Allied Forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. He is a former CIA director and a highly respected American foreign policy expert with Dutch roots from Friesland. Please give a warm welcome to General David Petraeus. Thanks very much, Robert. Uh, Frieslan Bapa. Uh, it's great Bapa. to be back in the old country, even if it is only virtually. Um, and wonderful be to be with the Atlantic Association again. Thank you. Are you ready for a tour around the globe, General? You bet. Absolutely. What time were you in the gym this morning? Uh, 6.30. 6.30, and what did you do? Uh, a lot of fitness uh, on a stationary bike and a variety of strength, flexibility, and aerobic activities. Okay, well, that sounds good. Um, I hope you're in good shape. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of ground to cover in only one hour. So um, questions like, uh, what is the direction of American uh, global leadership after the uh, US decision to leave Afghanistan? after the chaotic uh, evacuation from Kabul, and after the diplomatic row with France on AUKUS, defense deal between Australia, United States, and United Kingdom. Is the United States shifting away from Europe and pivoting to Asia? And what does that mean for uh, Western relations with China and Russia? And what does it mean for Europe's position? Now, let's divide this in four parts. We start with the US leadership, then we'll move on to Afghanistan and the future of foreign interventions. Uh, we'll uh, deal with, uh, subsequently with China and Indo-Pacific, and we'll conclude with NATO and EU's uh, strategic autonomy. So we have 15 minutes for each part with our guest, who is now uh, physically in his apartment in New York City. Um, we have already have received some good questions, and I hope you will join us with more. Now, General, um, let's have a look at the American leadership first. The transatlantic relationship under the Biden administration has been dominated by severe tensions in recent months. Now, let me quote European Council President Charles Michel, who said about one month ago, after uh, the mess in Kabul and after August, and uh, he, he referred to uh, the, the famous quote of Joe Biden, America is back. Well, what Charles Michel said was, what does that mean? Is America back in America or somewhere else? We don't know. General Petraeus, do you understand these kind of statements? I do actually, yeah. In fact, I've actually been doing some international travel uh, in the past month or so. I was in Warsaw three weeks ago for the Warsaw Security Forum. I'm on their board. Uh, I was in Rome the week after that. Each of these had a large number of you know, defense ministers and other government officials and so forth. Uh, I thought that I generally understood, because I'm very close to a number of individuals uh, in Europe, I understood the concerns that they had over what they perceived as a lack of consultation on the Afghanistan decision. Uh, and then, of course, with a special case of France with the uh, Australia, UK, US uh, nuclear submarine technology deal. Uh, but frankly, I found a lot more uh, concern there than I had even expected before being back in Europe. Um, now, let me actually put this in context, though, because I think it's very important to understand how the Biden administration has been approaching foreign policy, noting that, of course, you know, Joe Biden is a transatlanticist from the word go. He is a Munich security conference guy, even when he's not in government. Uh, and so that natural inclination is very, very strong. But I fully understand that the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan, when many of the European leaders just wanted to stay there, they, everybody recognized recognize that it was not winnable, but you could manage it. And certainly managing even an imperfect, uh, maddening, frustrating, corrupt, whatever government that was there is far better than obviously having the Taliban in charge. So that's the heart of this. But if you wind back to the beginning of the administration, President Biden, first of all, said, I think, properly, foreign policy more than ever before begins at home. 
So we have to solidify the domestic foundation. You have to combat the pandemic, bring back the economy, invest in infrastructure, and reduce the hyper-partisanship, bring the country together to, to the extent that you can. Doing pretty well against the pandemic. Uh, yeah, there was a Delta variant, but again, it just continues to gradually accumulate gradual successes against that. The economy is definitely coming back very strong. Uh, if anything, in fact, the worry is uh, about maybe more persistent inflation than otherwise would be the case. Uh, the infrastructure, I think there will be <clears throat> ultimately two laws that are passed, two bills that will result in that. It'll be the result of a lot of wrangling and compromise. You know, whether the country can come back together again, we can come back to uh, a, a bit later on. But the domestic foundation is the focus. And then they had a very carefully orchestrated set of moves, engaged the leaders in the Indo-Pacific region. So you had the Quad, you have all of our other allies and partners out there. Then came to Europe. He did the G7 in the UK summit, uh, summit with the UK leader as well. Uh, the EU summit, the NATO summit, you know, summits everywhere, and then even a summit with Putin. And then the plan was together with everyone to have a coherent, comprehensive whole of governments with an S on the end approach to the most important relationship in the world, which is China. And then Afghanistan hit. And Afghanistan really just took, you know, as we say, the oxygen out of the room. Everything was focused on that chaotic evacuation. There's a lot of questions. We can talk about that uh, in a subsequent session. But clearly, that really jolted the U.S. It derailed what was a pretty smooth working orchestrated effort, again, focused on the rebalance to Asia, not a pivot. We're not pivoting away from Europe. You are rebalancing the focus to the Indo-Pacific, even as you are still maintaining very strong ties uh, with Europe, the transatlantic and, and all the rest of this in other places around the world. Uh, and in everywhere else where there are Islamist extremists, we are doing what we should do, which is keep an eye and pressure on them, disrupting and degrading their capabilities whenever it appears that they could carry out attacks beyond the domestic situations and helping in those as well to the host nation governments. But Afghanistan obviously is the one that again, pulled this off track. And to add to that, of course, then you have the dense in the relationship with, with France, which let's remember is our longest standing ally. Had it not been for the French uh, blockading Yorktown, we would not have won the Battle of Yorktown in 1781 and wouldn't have had the Paris uh, Peace Treaty in 1783, which again gave us our independence from the, the Great Britain. So that's where we are. <clears throat> and clearly it is incumbent. And I can tell you, I can affirm to you because I have heard from at least two of the three that the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, Secretary of Defense, and Biden himself all recognize that they need now to shore back up this yeah. crucial, crucial relationship with our NATO allies and partners uh, above all, uh, so that you can get back to, again, the focus on the coherent, comprehensive whole of government's approach to China. They know they need to do that. They have been doing it. You saw where they all were two and three weeks ago, all in Paris and Brussels and all the other places in Europe. Uh, it, the Secretary of Defense has just been out in Eastern Europe uh, as well. They're doing working on that. But again, unfortunately, Afghanistan is going to be with us. And that remains a, a bruise to this crucial relationship. OK, but let me refer to AUKUS, what Michel said on that. He said, the ele elementary principles for allies are transparency and trust, and it goes together. And what do we observe? We are observing a lack of transparency and loyalty. President of the European Council saying this about the United States. Sure. Yeah, no, look, uh, this is a situation, I've heard it, I can't go into it because of the ground rules of the conversation, but individuals in Washington were assured that Australia had engaged France. You know, this would not be a big surprise. This is all going to be they know that Australia is preparing to go in a different direction, as they say in the business world. Obviously, that wasn't the case. And France took this very personally, withdrew its ambassador from Washington and Canberra for the first time ever. Again, noting, as I said, this is the longest standing alliance in our history. We would not have achieved independence when we did had the French not been with us in key battles, especially, again, the ultimate battle at Yorktown. Um, so, yes, this is a big blow. Uh, and I'm a I'm a transatlanticist. I'm actually, I think I'm wearing the uh, French Légion d'honneur today. Uh, again, <laughs> we recognize that we have to get back to that. Yes, I should have put in the very gaudy Dutch. I'm yeah, you have your Dutch knighthood. Where is your Dutch knighthood? 
Come on. It's too <laughs> you know, the Dutch are generally very simple, frugal, you know. Also, that thing looks, it's got all kinds of little curly cues on it. So again, it's a little bit much for New York. You love orange. Yeah. <laughs> so do I. Um, so again, this is the, there is a recognition in Washington. There is an appreciation for the bruises uh, from Afghanistan and AUKUS and the key leaders, the key department heads, uh, Department of State, Department of Defense, National Security Advisor, President, all recognize this. And they have done a great deal uh, to try to mitigate uh, further damage and to ameliorate the damage that has been done. But there's an awareness of it and, and they know that they have to show. Because look, the problem here is that with Afghanistan, we gave China an issue uh, that they could use. And they could say, we told you the US is a, is a power in decline, and we told you that they're an unreliable partner and see what happened in Afghanistan. And of course, they say that to those uh, in that region in particular. Well, we got a question from Frank Turnersen, uh, D66 Defense. And he's asking, is the Biden administration sufficiently interested in restoring confidence? Oh, very much so. It has to. Again, so there's no doubt on your side on this. None. Keep in mind that, again, let me, let me give you the sort of metaphorical image of what the United States uniquely is. Uh, the U.S. is the guy in the circus who gets a plate on a stick and gets it spinning. And then he goes over and gets another plate, puts that on a stick, gets it spinning. Pretty soon, you know, you got all these plates on these sticks. Some are much bigger than others. The plate which represents the U.S. and allied and partner relationship with China is bigger than all the other plates in the circus tent put together. But you still have to keep all those plates spinning. The U.S. knows that it cannot do that alone. It knows that it, it certainly wants to exercise leadership. I mean, that's what Biden meant by the U.S. is back. Uh, but it also recognizes that it has to already shore up confidence uh, in the actions of the United States. Yeah. Because, again, you want to get the biggest plate. This is crucial. But you also have to keep all the other plates spinning. So there's other plates. There's North Korea. There's Russia. There's Iran. There's Islamist extremists, there's cyber threats, there's even domestic populism. I mean, all kinds of challenges. And the U.S. uniquely, I think, has to keep all of these different plates spinning, using in different cases this ally or that ally or partners or alliance together, which it's trying to do. Uh, and that's the way, I think, to understand what it is that this administration is trying to do in particular, noting again the overriding importance of the coherent, comprehensive whole of governments, S on the end, policy approach to China. That's the most important relationship in the world. Okay. Nevertheless, many Europeans are confused and are asking them themselves the question, to what extent is Biden's foreign policy really different from Trump's? Oh, I think it's, it's different in Apart a Apart from the well, multilateral part, which we all see, of course. Oh, I mean, that's, a, that's not a trivial part. I mean, he is a believer in multilateral organizations and alliances uh, in, to a much greater extent than was the, the previous president. Let's recognize. So he went back into the World Health Organization. He went back to the Paris Climate Accord. We're going to be on the human rights element of the UN, um, trying to get back to the Iran nuclear deal, um, embrace NATO, embrace the EU, embrace the G7. Um, again, so, and there are then substantive differences, uh, concern about uh, climate, uh, a, you know, a slightly a different approach to the pandemic, all of this, I think there are quite significant changes, although I think it is fair to argue, as the Council on Foreign Relations President Richard Haas has, that there are a number of elements of continuity in our foreign policy as well. I mean, he is continuing a variety of different initiatives, and probably the most important would have to do with uh, some of the issues involving trade with China, tariffs, entities, lists, and, and so forth, which are not trivial uh, to those in the business community, I can tell you. So at, as always, there are elements of uh, change and also elements of continuity in American foreign policy from administration to administration. But I do think that some of these differences are really quite significant, and they are both in a sense, philosophical about organizations, allies, partners, and so forth. And they are substance about certain issues 
on which there are real differences of opinion. In particular, again, uh, climate would be one of those. Democracy and ideals and freedoms and all the rest, probably uh, a bit of another. And of course, so we have the climate uh, meeting that is coming up in Glasgow. You have the uh, summit of the democracies and so forth, which uh, President Biden will host. Uh, again, these are, I think, substantively different from what uh, a second term of a uh, Trump presidency would have brought us. Okay. Uh, we have a question of Laura Osdam, and she, she uh, asked, uh, will Biden lead by example, as he has promised, or will his foreign policy goals fall victim to rising domestic discontent and political polarization? What do you think? Well, I think there, there are always challenges to campaign rhetoric when you actually end up in the White House. And you can see that, um, you know, let's just take our relationship with Egypt. Uh, it's easy to be critical of Egypt uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, but of course, when you're actually in office and you need to deal with the reality on the ground and you, and you recognize, again, the nuances, the complexities, the fact that you've never seen such a good relationship between Israel and Egypt, that is not a trivial issue, uh, and the other factors that are here, and you then start to make some modifications uh, and you have to adjust to realities. And we have seen that again in a number of different cases, uh, specific cases involving specific countries. Nord Stream 2, um, again, at the end of the day, the US essentially um, modified its opposition to that, allowed it in a sense to go forward without further, uh, but, but albeit with very various qualifications uh, and adjustments that need to be made uh, to accommodate the concerns uh, of individuals of Russia being able to bypass Ukraine and other Eastern European countries. So again, it, it's easy in a campaign to have rhetoric that later you have to uh, modify somewhat. But, but again, it's all about where sort of on a spectrum, and I think on the spectrum, we're in a different place on the spectrum uh, from where we would have been with a second term of the previous president. Is that possible, a second term of the previous president? <laughs> because many people are worried about it in Europe and also in the United States. Everybody has read Robert Kagan, uh, uh, Kagan's alarming piece in the, in the Washington Post. What is your take on this? Well, I, again, in a general sense, I am a big believer in institutions. Uh, I believe the strength of the United States over the centuries has been it resides in institutions uh, that are larger than individuals. Um, and so I think the concerns that Bob Kagan has at home and abroad as well, you know, The Jungle Grows Back is a fantastic book as well, but very alarming. The concern with the erosion, uh, again, of norms, um, institutions, and so forth, uh, that is real, and we should be concerned about that. And you should always be concerned about it. And we saw cases toward the end of the previous administration where those uh, were eroded uh, somewhat. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a domestic uncertainty. Uh, we also have an international uncertainty. We live in an era of great power competition. Um, don't you think that the rise of leaders like uh, Putin and Xi Jinping uh, have created a new reality that America has no longer the position to dictate or determine the outcome of events as it used to do. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure I would completely embrace the idea that the U.S. has had the ability to dictate events. Um, certainly there was that period of the so-called unipolar moment uh, that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, of course, this whole thesis that was uh, captured in Francis Fukuyama's great article uh, in 1989, I think it was, uh, the end of history. But, you know, Francis Fukuyama has then more recently said, well, history is back. Uh, and the systemic competition that, that he wrote about between uh, Western democratically elected governance and free market economics uh, against the Soviet communist government and a command economy, which again collapsed of its own weight, which he predicted, of course, six or 12 months in advance. And 
you know, got a book deal out of it and all the rest of that deservedly. But more recently, he said, well, you know, again, systemic uh, competition is back. And China's uh, Communist Party, uh, quite impressive uh, technocratic leadership, certainly without the number of the freedoms and so forth and that we embrace. Uh, and their uh, hyper competitive uh, free market economy, albeit now one with uh, state owned enterprises, once again, uh, getting a fairly uh, considerable degree of prominence in terms of funding and so forth and some state uh, intervention there. Uh, but again, they they achieved and now 42 years, I guess it is whenever from when Deng Xiaoping welcomed the world to China. Uh, they achieved economic growth that has never been seen remotely before, uh, albeit now facing a number of different okay. uh, challenges, slowing growth, demographic decline, and a variety of other issues as they evolve uh, and you know, have to escape the middle income trap and all the rest of that. We'll, we'll get to China uh, later. Um, is there anybody in the room here that has a question for the general? on American leadership. I think I would like to have a short question. No, so we, because of the time, we, we, we should really refrain from statements. Uh, if you have a pointed question. A pointed question. Uh, just wait for the mic and then. Uh, Robert, thank you very much in general. Thank you very Could much. Could you please introduce yourself? Kees van Rij, I'm a former ambassador of the Netherlands. Um, I wanted to ask about Russia because you, well, you did mention it as one of the blocks to be discussed, uh, the general mentioned, uh, uh, I think briefly Putin, or you did, but uh, how do we see our relation with, uh, with Russia? S certainly since uh, diplomatic relations between NATO and Russia have been broken since a few days. Okay. Well, obviously it's a very, very difficult relationship. Um, Putin has, uh, you know, he is somebody who truly does believe what he said in the previous century, that the worst day in you know, the history of mankind was the day in which the Soviet Union collapsed. And he actually means that. And he has essentially been trying ever since in his various positions to restore Russia uh, and to reestablish whatever of the Soviet Union that he can reestablish, perhaps the Russian Empire and so forth, and has pursued a variety of economic security and uh, other initiatives to try to do that. Not many of these have, you know, achieved much. The Eurasia Economic Union, for example, is not even a pale carbon copy of the EU. But nonetheless, of course, he invaded uh, the Donbass, uh, Crimea occupation, uh, active in Syria, uh, active in Libya, and active in a variety of other locations, most of which are not helpful to what it is that we and our allies and partners in Europe in particular are trying to do. I mean, I guess we should be thankful uh, that he he's the greatest gift to NATO since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and again, NATO has a very significant uh, reason to live, if you will, in part because of the aggressive actions of Putin. Uh, and indeed, the unifying feature of NATO, especially now that uh, we're out of Afghanistan, uh, there's certainly some other out of area missions, including a train and equip mission in Baghdad and so forth. But the real focus uh, is on what, how to ensure that we deter Russia and that there is no smash and grab in the Baltics. And of course, what was interesting about the previous administration, the Trump administration, largely continued all of the initiatives that were begun under the Obama administration when it came to having to deal with Russia in various ways. And that remains true uh, with the Biden administration with probably a little bit more uh, emphasis on support for Ukraine. In fact, our, our Secretary of Defense was just there, General Lloyd Austin. Uh, but of course, we have the battalions, the battle groups in the three Baltic states. The U.S. are in each one of those. We have, I was just as in Poland, as I mentioned, there's a you know, better part of a brigade that is uh, out there. And there's a new NATO uh, headquarters to push in a sense, the logistics and all the means uh, that we would need out further east from where they used to be focused on the inner German border. Uh, and you've even seen a maritime command uh, that has been reestablished as well, all in, in reaction to aggressive activities by Putin and Russia. And he has indeed uh, resourced uh, a number of his military units. They are quite capable. Uh, they do carry out large exercises, as they did. 100,000, I think, was the most recent one, uh, to try to, to show and to intimidate 
uh, other countries, and he's doing everything he can to make sure that Ukraine does not emerge as his worst nightmare. And his worst nightmare, of course, would be a country on his border uh, that is a vibrant, uh, prosperous, and successful democracy. And that's why he's worked so hard to undermine that in, in Ukraine. Okay. Um, let's have a look, uh, a quick look at Afghanistan and the future of foreign interventions. And let me ask you a personal question. What did you think when you saw the images of the chaotic uh, evacuation and the glorious Taliban? Did you think, well, all my, all, all my work has been for nothing? No, not at all. Uh, I think we gave 20 years of in certain, and particularly in the urban areas, a really quite extraordinary opportunity to Afghanistan and Afghans. But obviously that outcome, I can only describe it as heartbreaking uh, to see what we saw. Uh, it was tragic. Um, there's no way that you can put a positive spin on this whatsoever, in my view. Um, you basically replaced the government that, as I said, however imperfect, um, allowed freedom of speech and uh, Women could go to college. My wife and I actually have a scholarship or had a scholarship at the American University of Afghanistan for a female to go there every year. That female is now in Qatar. Uh, and, you know, I think the outcome was disastrous. Again, to see uh, an organization in charge uh, that is essentially ruling the country by a seventh century interpretation, ultra conservative interpretation of Islam, uh, and a group that allowed al-Qaeda to have the sanctuary on their soil in which the 9-11 attacks were planned and the initial training of the attackers was conducted. Uh, and, of course, the economy has completely imploded. Um, there's no money in the banks. Uh, they had a 35-year terrible, you know, the worst drought in 35 years prior to this. So you already had a country that was on the edge of starvation. Uh, and it's a question as to whether or not they can even keep the lights on. Beyond that, of course, the Taliban are now finding out that it's much easier to be insurgents, terrorists, than it is to be counterinsurgents and actually have to provide security uh, as the Islamic State is blowing up Shia mosques uh, in two Fridays in a row, uh, as uh, resistance forces are galvanizing and coming together and fighting the Taliban in various locations, mostly still in the north. Uh, but but spreading their particular activities, uh, including in the Panjshir once again, from which the Taliban have largely withdrawn. Um, and of course, the prospect of, uh, of Al-Qaeda and even the prospect of internal uh, disputes between the Afghan Taliban Mullah Brader and say the Haqqani network. And Mullah Brader, of course, has gone to Kandahar. The Haqqani leader, Suraj Ghani, is in, uh, yeah. in, in Kabul. Yeah. So again, I, look, I think that the outcome was heartbreaking, tragic, and disastrous, um, and especially because it really didn't have to end this way. Yeah. We had about 3,500 troops there. We hadn't lost a soldier in combat in 18 months. The idea, the option could have been, and it was I publicly advanced it for years, uh, of a sustainable, sustained commitment, sustainability measured in the expenditure of blood and treasure. We'd gotten that down so far. Remember, when I was the commander in Afghanistan, we had 150,000. U.S. and uh, NATO and non-NATO coalition forces. This was down to under uh, 12 or 13,000, uh, 3,500 U.S., 8,500 coalition. Most of the coalition wanted to stay. And frankly, it was the withdrawal, not just of them, but then the 18,000 contractors who used to maintain the sophisticated U.S. provided helicopters and planes that were crucial to the entire defense concept of Afghanistan. Again. There's no other way to defend Afghanistan, the critical population centers and the critical infrastructure than the way it was set up, which is that you have forces all around the country, army, maybe 100,000 or so, yeah. all around these major areas. When they get hit by the Taliban, you have a very large reserve of 30 to 40,000 special operations forces and commandos. You put them on planes or helicopters, you get them out to the front to reinforce the front lines. And that did happen actually early on, particularly in Kandahar and also in a couple of places in the north. But once the contractors are withdrawn and the helicopters and planes can't be maintained, I, I three months prior to the collapse, I publicly said that I feared a psychological collapse of Afghan forces. And that's exactly what you saw. So there was a degree of inevitability to this. Um, it wasn't seen as clearly as perhaps it might have been. 
But at the end of the day, again, this is an outcome that I cannot, obviously don't celebrate. And now, I think it's yeah. for the country and for the region. And now we're in the next chapter. And the big question for the international community is, should we recognize the Taliban? Like Jonathan Tavernier has asked you, what do you think? Should we recognize Taliban? No. Uh, again, at the very no? least, we no. You at the very least, we need to wait and see. Um, you know, in the early days uh, when the Taliban took over, they had a fairly slick uh, public affairs officer who was portraying that this would be a kinder, gentler Taliban. <clears throat> Women would be able to go to school after all, beyond just elementary school. They'd be able to be in the economy. Uh, they would have rights and so forth. And of course, none of that has proven to be true. Uh, and the kind of summary justice that is being meted out is very capricious, very, bar really quite brutal and barbaric. Uh, it, it appears as if the new Taliban is very close to the old Taliban that ruled the country from the mid 90s until 2001. Uh, and that is not a heartening prospect. And so I don't know why you would recognize a government. And again, the government isn't even fully established. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it faces enormous hardship. But is there going to be a humanitarian catastrophe? Yes. Do we need to figure out how to provide humanitarian assistance? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, but it shouldn't be done in a way that empowers the Taliban. It should be in a way that gets directly to the people that is to the extent that it's okay. absolutely possible. But we are going to see a huge refugee crisis. Uh, and the recipient of that, most of all, uh, unfortunately, will be a fragile country to the east of over 200 million people. Uh, with its own problems with extremism uh, and so forth. And that is, of course, Pakistan uh, and an economy that is also relatively fragile as well. So Afghanistan is not not only not going to leave our rearview mirrors, it is still going to be in front of us as an issue. And we'll have to deal with this. And indeed, the international community is doing that. It had a conference it, uh, uh, generated about a billion dollars of commitments and so forth. And there will have to be a lot more. Your PhD uh, dissertation was on the impact of lessons uh, from Vietnam for military leaders. What uh, do you think are the lessons from this Af Afghan drama for the world? Well, I think the big overarching lessons from, say, 20 years are that you, you have to get the inputs right much more rapidly than we did. Uh, I have publicly said noted that we did not even get the inputs right in Afghanistan, much less the outputs, uh, until late 2010. Think about that. That's nine years that it took us to get roughly the right number of troops, the right strategy, which is most important, the right big ideas, the right leaders, uh, the right organizational architecture. We had a real problematic uh, architecture in the beginning, which was part of the led to the confusion and the uh, lack of success of the operation in Tora Bora to try to capture Osama bin Laden and his fighters before they fled to Pakistan. Um, so we had all of these issues, uh, including a lack of sufficient understanding about the country in the very beginning and for a number of years uh, into it. But now, yes, it coincided that I was the commander in 2010, but it really was the Obama policy review to which I contributed, obviously, as the commander of U.S. Central Command initially, the entire theater. Uh, and only a year or so after that did I take over uh, when yeah. General McChrystal retired. But, but uh, he I, deserves I, credit I, I, for setting that in yeah. place and getting that going. But, but I mean, that's the biggest thing, the lesson is don't divert your focus. Yeah, but uh, We went into Afghanistan and we immediately started focusing elsewhere. And yes, I was part of the problem later on during the surge in Iraq because we needed everything that the U.S. could provide. And so, as Admiral Mullen used to say, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, in Iraq, we do what we must, and in Afghanistan, we do what we can. And that did not change until late 2010. And then we began the drawdown within six months of actually getting the inputs right. And in many cases, the drawdown was based more on political imperatives in Washington or in the United States than it was on conditions on the ground. But, is it, is uh, but, but ultimately, we actually got to a place that was not all bad. We figured out how to do this with 3,500 troops and a lot of drones and air support for Afghan forces who were doing the fighting and taking the casualties on the front lines. It is their country. Let me, and they let were me fighting. The, that, by the way, yeah. the idea that the Afghans wouldn't fight for their country, was just that's, a, that's just absolutely not true. And it's not fair.
Is it something it, like 26 or 27 times as many Afghans died as did uh, Americans? So I, they took enormous casualties. My question is: Is it the end of nation building? No. Um, and again, you know, one of the criticisms is that you know where it went wrong when we started doing nation building. But if you don't build host nation security forces, host nation institutions, how do you transition tasks that you are performing? You know, if you topple a government, you own it. Uh, and the same thing in Iraq, you have to do. Now, did we get, did we go overboard with some nation building? Certainly. Did we build structures that were more Western design and therefore require lots of power and air conditioning and flat screen TVs than, you know, should have been for the Afghans. Of course, yeah, we made a number of mistakes in that regard. But do you think but that- You have to build host nation forces. Yeah, but- and, and do, Let me point one other thing as well. Now, hang on a second. Let me, you're, you're, they want to hear me with respect. Who is doing the interview? The idea that- <laughs> uh, Are you interviewing uh, me? Okay. I'll, I'll be happy to drop off and they can listen to you. Make up your mind. Um, no, so here's the deal. Uh, the, in fact, one of my old colleagues said, well, we should have made the Afghan forces more like the insurgents. They're not insurgents. They have to defend yeah. fixed locations, fixed population centers, critical infrastructure. They don't pick and choose when they want to attack like insurgents do. They have to actually defend it. And so there is no other alternative than to creating, you know, roughly, can you say that there were some issues that we, we should not. I, I actually opposed the idea of U.S. provided uh, equipment. Okay. We were providing sort of Russian and Soviet still when I was there, and they could maintain that. So there were, again, within these overarching concepts, there were, again, missteps, mistakes, and so forth, and there have to be lessons learned. But at the end of the day, uh, the concept of the Afghan security forces was inescapable. Okay. You could not do it any other way. You made your point clear. But the que nevertheless, the question is, is the Afghan exit, the withdrawal from the United States, leader of NATO, is it good news for dictators and evil regimes? Well, a number of uh, extremist organizations certainly have celebrated the Taliban takeover. So I think you have your answer there. Uh, and again, if... You are some authoritarian somewhere who was concerned that President Biden might lead democracies and freedom-loving nations against them, then perhaps you might rest a little bit easier, except that, again, as I mentioned earlier, Afghanistan is an outlier. Everywhere else around the world, we are not only keeping the plate spinning, we are approaching it appropriately, I think. And... Uh, you know, the U.S. defense budget, which many people thought would go down under this administration compared to the Trump administration, is actually going to go up. Uh, and I think it could be more than inflation. So that is a very significant. Keep in mind, by the way, Robert, that the U.S. doesn't just spend more than all of its 29 NATO allies put together. It spends more than twice as much as all of them put together. Uh, so this is a very, very significant reality and European leaders have confronted this reality when they have said, you know, we need to be more independent. We need our own capabilities. I'm all for that. Show me the additional cyber battalions or uh, tank battalions or what have you. Don't just reorganize headquarters uh, and reallocate forces that already exist. I think it's about additional capabilities. Uh, and that's what I think gets people's attention. Okay. I think we have a question there in the back. Can we have the mic there on the, on the third row? Yeah, thanks a lot, General. Thank you for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ed Cronenberg. Uh, I'm also a former ambassador of the Netherlands. Uh, but I also worked at NATO and have been closely involved with what was going on in Afghanistan. Uh, in hindsight, I'm wondering whether uh, the Enduring Freedom mission and the ISAF mission were compatible. Because I realize now that when working at NATO and dealing with ISAF, we didn't know a lot about what was going on under Enduring Freedom. And maybe that's been one of the root causes of why things went wrong in the first place. Um, Thank you. With, with respect, Ambassador, I'm not sure I agree. Uh, once we got the right organizational architecture, where you had Com ISAF, who is reporting to a NATO operational chain of command, and also Com US Forces Afghanistan, which is what you're probably... Enduring Freedom actually was just the name of a campaign for all U.S. forces. 
But I think that what you're implying is the U.S. only elements, so our Joint Special Operations Command, our Special Mission Units and others, which were under the under me in my U.S. hat. Uh, in that regard, uh, we you know we unified that effort by unifying that position. And but this was one of the elements that we did not get right until we that U.S. force headquarters was not even fully established until I was the commander in Afghanistan. Uh, for a good three or four months, as I recall. Uh, but once you have one person wearing both hats, you have a unified effort, and I think that's exactly what you're trying to achieve. And that same commander is judging, you know, will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by its conduct? And that is a big test that should be applied to all operations, whether they are conducted by U.S.-only forces or uh, coalition NATO forces, keeping in mind that the biggest NATO force far and away was, again, the American force. Uh, it was, you know, again, some hundred thousand or roughly. And then we had these few thousand of other or less uh, that were U.S. only forces conducting U.S. counterterrorism missions that contributed to the effort in Afghanistan and indeed on occasion beyond Afghanistan soil, as in the operation that brought Osama bin Laden to justice in the final few months that I was the commander that mission having to be conducted under CIA authorities that night because we didn't have authority to go outside the country. Okay. Let's move to China and the Indo-Pacific. Um, hot potato, obviously. Uh, how significant, uh, how big a threat is China in your view? Well, I think the way to put it is that China is a very, very complex reality. And the U.S., China, and U.S. and all our partners and allies relationship, uh, these are very, very complex. Um, people who use the terminology Cold War, uh, of course, have to remember that during the Cold War, the U.S.-led West, NATO, and so forth against the Soviet-led East and the Warsaw Pact, um, there was very little economic uh, interaction. Uh, maybe every now and then the U.S. would sell some surplus wheat but probably little, little more than a billion dollars. And, and yet China, uh, depending on which category imports or exports, is uh, always in the top three. It's often number one in terms of uh, some of our imports, along with obviously the two countries with whom we share a continent, North America, those being Canada and Mexico. So on the one hand, you have an enormous amount. You cannot decouple. You can actually do some some decoupling in certain sensitive technologies and some others, which is all going on uh, because of, again, concerns in various ways. But you have this very complex relationship where we actually do share common goals, we believe, when it comes to issues such as climate, pandemic, uh, even the global economy. But then there are obviously areas of very intense competition, some in the in the economic sphere, trade, and so forth, and even in terms of systemic competition. And then, of course, there is the potential uh, that China could be an adversary. And, of course, that's where we have to focus intently to make sure that this coherent, comprehensive whole of government's approach shores up deterrence. And deterrence, as you all know, is a function of a potential adversary's assessment of your capabilities and of your willingness to employ them. And so in the sense that Afghanistan, to come back to it, shows that maybe our will is not what we would like to think it is, that's where you've got to be uh, very, very careful. And this is what something that, again, the leaders in Washington are keenly aware uh, that our credibility has to be solid uh, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. And this is the focus uh, of this administration. Okay. Again, the biggest play that we have to keep spinning bigger than all the others is the plate that represents China. Let me follow up immediately with a question from uh, Frank van Vliet from The Telegraph, big newspaper in the Netherlands. Um, and he, he wonders how serious uh, is the situation around Taiwan? And is the United States really prepared to defend Taiwan if it escalates? What do you yeah, um, again, you've seen in recent weeks in particular, in part as a reaction to AUKUS and also some other uh, developments, uh, a historically high number of aircraft from China 
that have entered the air defense identification zone of Taiwan. Now, it's very important to look at a map and to look at what an ADIS is, the air defense identification zone. It is way beyond the airspace uh, of Taiwan. And, and China has been very careful not to intrude on that particular airspace. Uh, ADIS is, my understanding is, they're basically drawn by countries just to tell the world that when you enter this space, uh, you will be tracked by our uh, radar, our air traffic control, and so forth. Now, this is a big concern. I don't want to downplay this, but it is by no means the same as actually entering a country's sovereign airspace. Um, and so, yeah, that's you know that has to be a concern. And those in Washington have rightly uh, issued statements about that concern uh, to make sure that China is aware of our uh, reaction to that. There's a variety of approaches uh, with Taiwan in terms of additional arms sales and to all of the other countries that are on the maritime periphery of the first island chain and the second island chain uh, as well. But again, the focus, this is what I keep coming back to, the entire focus uh, of U.S. policy first and foremost, while keeping all the other plates spinning, is this particular relationship because it is the most important in the world. And obviously, Taiwan is a potential flashpoint in that relationship. And everyone has to be very careful uh, to avoid miscalculation, mistake, misperception that could ultimately then explode into real conflict. And again, there is a keen awareness of that in Washington and I would add in other capitals around the world. But is the United States willing to defend Taiwan? Um, again, the U.S. is never, there is a, as you know, there is a degree of what might be termed constructive ambiguity uh, to that. I think all officials are extra careful, even former officials, uh, in commenting on that. Uh, and so I'm not going to get into that. Um, but if you listen to, say, our national security advisor or secretary of state on that issue, uh, they are very always very precise how they state that, and they do not answer that directly because of this built-in uh, degree of ambiguity that, that exists on this issue. Is there any role in that region for Europe? Because Certainly the, the AUKUS deal, is, isn't that a proof that the United States and the, and the other involved countries are not thinking of Europe? The EU. Uh, is, is the UK not in Europe still? Well, it's not a member of the EU anymore. I, but I think Europe is a bigger description than the EU. No, well, the, well the EU, people uh, inside in the EU think that they were uh, neglected, not only France. Well, again, this is a deal between Australia, UK, Europe, and the United States. Certainly, again, as I mentioned up front, there is a keen awareness that that bruised uh, the longest standing alliance uh, that the U.S. has had. Uh, the country that in our hour of greatest peril enabled us to achieve our independence. And that is they keenly felt in Washington. And again, keep in mind, Tony Blinken grew up in Paris. I mean, he's a Francophile. He is a fluent French speaker. Uh, so they know this and they're trying to remedy the situation. And again, I think there was just a, a lack of appreciation for the uh, insufficient communication that had taken place between Canberra Exactly. Uh, and Paris. That's sort of a one-off, though, Robert. But, I think that will that will go into the rearview mirror. No, but, <clears throat> and but not, whether whether Europe, <clears throat> and it's not in this case just the EU or even the UK or other <clears throat> countries. It's about specific countries and their relationship with China. No. And you will remember <clears throat> that Chancellor Merkel, in her final uh, few months uh, last year. Uh, as the head, again, the rotational head, if you will, of the EU, got the investment deal done with China. <clears throat> and then because of statements by Chinese diplomats, that deal was put on hold. Again, clearly, uh, the U.S. and the EU uh, have to work together when it comes, you know, keep coming back, Robert, to that biggest of the big idea, whole of governments with an S on the end. That includes allies and partners all around the world, not just those in the Indo-Pacific or those in the Quad, but all of them around the world, because that's what it will take to have the kind of united action that can hopefully influence uh, key issues uh, when it comes to Beijing and the leadership in China. Okay. Um, <clears throat> is there anybody in the room with a question on China? 
Yes, hello, my name is uh, Stefan Alonso. I'm from the Dutch daily newspaper NRT. <laughs> Um, I would like to ask you, you, you just called uh, Putin the greatest gift to NATO. I was wondering if maybe the United States and the positioning that it has right now in the repositioning in the world is the greatest gift to Europe, because there is a lot of talk about strategic autonomy, uh, that we should be more independent in a way. Um, I would like to know your view on this. Do you think that strategic autonomy is a realistic uh, endeavor in, in Europe? And what does Europe need to do to reach it? Well, I think, you know, as a conceptual idea, um, it's, you know, it is a valid concept. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, um, what impresses me is not conceptual ideas. Uh, what impresses me is additional infantry battalions, tank battalions, cyber battalions, uh, space battalions. What, it, what will impress me is every country in Europe spending 2% of GDP on defense, the way they all the leaders agreed at the Wales summit uh, some years ago. Uh, and so again, the ideas are inadequate. Uh, they have to be operationalized. And the reality, as I mentioned earlier, this is why I stated that fact, which is inescapable, that the US doesn't just spend more than all of its 29 NATO allies together, it spends in more than twice as much. In fact, it's actually two point something. Now, don't get me wrong. There is additional spending uh, that has taken place uh, in recent years as a result of a variety of factors, the, the commitments at the Wales Summit, uh, the uh, economic recovery following the Great Recession that enabled European countries to do more. Uh, again, desire certainly perhaps for additional capabilities that could enable some degree of uh, greater autonomy. Uh, but the reality is that when the United States decided to leave Afghanistan and to withdraw its 3,500 troops, there really wasn't an alternative. All 8,500 coalition forces essentially had to pull out because the US is the foundation piece for most of the significant uh, efforts around the world. There are some exceptions. Mali is an exception, although even there with the French leadership, you have a thousand US troops that are contributing to that. And even there, it's not clear that it'll, uh, the effort will be maintained uh, because of, again, the kinds of uh, difficulty with strategic patience uh, that are required in these types of situations. So again, look, I, I was a speechwriter for the Supreme Allied Commander all the way back when I was a major. I was a lieutenant in Cold War Europe. I was a major in Cold War Europe. I was a one-star, three-star, four-star NATO, uh, officer, um, dual hatted always with a U.S. position. I've heard and been to the, you know, the North Atlantic Council and so forth. I was the executive, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, would sit in the NATO Military Committee. I have heard endless talk of, again, European security initiatives, European autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. But just tell me how many additional forces are going to be generated and funded and resourced and maintained, by the way, because it's not even enough just to have the planes, they actually have to be operational. And you'll recall that one of the largest economy in Europe uh, some years ago uh, had a, 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 an aircraft fleet and ships and so forth that were not at the kind of operational readiness that is necessary. So uh, again, color me just a little bit. Um, you know, we have a, a motto, a state in the United States, the motto is show me, and I'm in the show me camp you know, when I see, show me what actually is going to be generated in addition. Uh, and then uh, again, we will be impressed and we'll applaud because again, everyone wants to see Europe uh, do more for its, its own defense. Uh, so that again, there can be a focus on the bigger uh, issue of the day, which again does reside in the Indo-Pacific so region. You, you don't think that the Afghan story, the Afghan end of the mission uh, has mm -hmm. weakened NATO? I didn't say that at all, Robert. No, it's a no, question. I think it it's should, a question. No, it, no, it should be very clear to you that, that that is something I didn't advise and that I think has caused... Robert, I explained no, no, this I mean, to you. In the long term. Right, I've just I've... been in Europe. And European leaders are concerned because of what the U.S. did. They felt they were not sufficiently consulted and they also disagreed with the actual policy decision. That doesn't, that doesn't help NATO. It undermines NATO. No, but has, it, has the end of the mission weakened NATO? For the, for, the next, for the coming years? It has caused challenges for NATO, yes. It hasn't made it stronger, so presumably it has made it, you know, it has 
created challenges for NATO. I've been very clear about that. Okay. Uh, and again, I have been very clear to say that the Americans are keenly aware of that and that they know that they are going to have to shore up not just European, but global confidence in United States credibility and will. Let's remember when you have an issue, say, remember the red line in Syria over the use of did not actually take action. We almost did, and then we hesitated, uh, and then ultimately Russia came up with some solution. Uh, that does echo and re-echo around the world. Uh, and U.S. credibility is very, very important, not just to the United States, but to all of our allies and partners together. And again, leaders in Washington are very keenly aware of that, and that's what they're trying already to shore up and to, to reassure NATO. Again, that's why the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, we're all over there. That's why the president was on the phone. The flurry of phone calls and so forth is an effort to begin that process of reassuring an alliance whose leaders, many of whom, uh, called into question, uh, again, our credibility. So what do, you, what, what, what do you make then specifically of all those European ambitions, uh, thinking about an entry force of about 5,000 uh, men, uh, going uh, to the Gulf or Northern Africa to do uh, mi missions, EU missions outside the e uh, outside Europe. What do you make of that? Is that a credible European defense initiative? Uh, conceptually, again, there are valid missions. Obviously, some of the issues that the EU has had, if you think about the biggest challenge to domestic, um, to our, to our, NATO partners, our allies, uh, in recent years, I think among the very biggest challenges that they have faced was that which resulted from the uh, exodus of millions of Syrians uh, from their country because of the civil war, the brutal civil war prosecuted by the murderous Bashar al-Assad. And that caused the largest challenges to the democracies of our NATO allies. So refugee issues are huge. Uh, the EU has sought to do a lot about that, of course. Again, still always wrangling and, and democracy is messy, but the EU border force and a variety of other initiatives to try to uh, control that flow and so forth, initiatives in the source countries, um, you know, is a force there? Could a force be used for something? Well, conceivably. Um, but again, does it really have the wherewithal to do something meaningful? I, again, without actually seeing what the force is, understanding what the authorities are, uh, and so forth. I was just with the chairman of the, uh, the in a sense, the military committee for the EU force, uh, a great Italian four star on stage in Rome last week. Um, and uh, again, General Claudio Graziano, uh, who I knew when he was, I think, the army chief and then the chief of defense staff in Italy when I was in, in Afghanistan, I believe, we had a good conversation about this. But the question is, again, what will the actual forces be how quickly can they be committed? Uh, do nations still have to go through a commitment process? What will the, the resourcing be for them? What missions will they undertake? Again, it's all so conceptual right now uh, as to, I think, defy any kind of judgment uh, yeah. about what it is they might do. And the Euro European Union becoming a, a global political player and perhaps a military player, that's also very conceptual for you? I mean, the EU is a global mil uh, political player. You think so? Uh, oh, absolutely. Sure, sure. I mean, you look at any major diplomatic endeavor, whether it's the Iran nuclear accord or anything else, uh, and again, the EU high representative has been a significant participant in those kinds of endeavors. Um, again, the military is a bit different. This is, It is not set up yet, certainly the way that NATO is, and I'm not sure, again, keeping in mind that the linchpin, the foundation, the keystone of NATO is U.S. Um, and arguably even North American, because Canada is not a European country, needless to say. So that, without that particular keystone, uh, then I think it's, again, it very much remains to be seen at the least. But, but again, look, Americans generally applaud anything additional that Europeans want to do. And there are plenty of uh, still issues within uh, the greater European continent. If you look at the former Yugoslavia and you look at the recent challenge that was 
had in Kosovo. Uh, you look at the continuing issues that plague some of the other former Yugoslav countries. Uh, you look at some challenges, and not to mention the challenges of that are posed, say, by a Viktor Orban in Hungary. Okay. I saw a question on the second row. You can bring the mic there. My name is René Kupiris from the Klingendal International Institute. I have a question about domestic politics in the US. In, in Europe, one of the worries is uh, to what extent is America a reliable ally in the long run, given the domestic polarization and uh, political problems in the US in, 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 in the near future? Is that also one of the problems for NATO, maybe? Well, it depends on the issue, I think, because I think something that is lost perhaps on the rest of the world, is that there is actually bipartisan consensus uh, on the biggest of the big ideas that I have described, which is again, the need for a coherent, comprehensive whole of government's approach to China. Uh, and again, that is across the aisle. Uh, that is bipartisan, and it is not just bipartisan on Capitol Hill or in Washington, DC, it is bipartisan broadly throughout the country. Uh, and of course, the previous administration really did change the conversation on that particular in, uh, issue, and it has remained uh, on that issue as well. Now, then if you get into specific other issues, uh, again, I'd almost have to work down a list of those issues as to whether or not, you know, I think there's still a bipartisan consensus that we need to keep an eye and pressure on always in support of host nation forces on Islamist extremists, wherever they may be. You need to have a sustained, sustainable approach to that, to be sure, whether it's Syria, Iraq, Somalia, Mali, West Africa, other places in Africa, uh, elsewhere in Asia, Southeast Asia, and so forth. Um, so again, I'd have to walk down the different issues and ask um, you know, whether there is bipartisan consensus on it or not. I, I don't think that the, you know, looking from the outside at the partisanship that we do see, which is very, very fierce. Um, I don't think that that necessarily translates into um, really partisan debates on, on foreign policy issues writ large. Uh, and I think you'd actually find there's probably more consensus on the really big issues uh, than you might actually realize. And, and that would involve, I think, NATO and our European allies and partners uh, in particular. Okay, let me follow up on this. Um, how should Europe, or the EU, as you might prefer, uh, prepare, prepare for a possible return of, uh, of Trump in the three years? Is there any need to prepare? Look, first of all, three years in the, in the United States politics is an eternity. Um, you know, let's, we're still a year away from That's the a clever war. answer. Um, and again, again, our democracy is noisy. It is amplified by social media, which is amplified by news channels that sort of cater to different um, parts of the political spectrum. Um, all of this does make this a more again, just a very, very, it's almost a cacophony of these different, and uh, you have to step back from that a bit, I think, uh, try to get a bit of perspective, uh, try to understand again, um, where there is actual possibility of bipartisan action. Um, but again, speculating about three years from now, much less one year from now. I, know, I mean, let's just, let's just watch the government gubernatorial election in Virginia okay, but first, takes place in November. And again, as to whether someone should, quote, prepare for it, I mean, that's somewhat nonsensical. But, but that your eternity could be helpful for Europe because Europe is always, uh, it's not very acting very uh, fast. So how could Europe use those three years to prepare for a possible return of Trump? I wouldn't even speculate on that. No? I mean, these are just, <laughs> uh, it's so hypothetical as to be not very valuable. Okay. I mean, there, there's so much waiting, you know, to people waiting. I mean, there are legal cases. There are all these other developments that have, that could have profound implications uh, for 2024. Um, and again, until those 
our resolve the, is just the, senseless yeah, to try to, the to French speculate would, Yeah, the French would say we would need we would need to push for strategic autonomy. That is the, the French, French answer. The French have been pushing for strategic autonomy since it left the, the integrated military structure of NATO. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember when I was a major, <laughs> France was not part of the, I, the integrated military structure and they actually left the room of the military committee when I think it was discussions over that, I don't know, nuclear issue. There were certain issues in which they did not participate. Um, again, it's a longstanding tradition um, and I mean, it is one way that the dynamic within the EU has obviously changed with Brexit because you used to have the UK sort of offsetting France with Germany sort of solidly in the center. Uh, and obviously those dynamics have been altered. But again, you know that far better than I do. You know, I'm sitting in America, not in Europe, uh, but I do get over there fairly frequently. Is there anyone in the room with a question, a, a short, punctual question? Yeah, and this is, but it's only a question. Eh? We, we, of course, the general is very. Uh, I think I think actually schedule. what we've heard about at the end of the. Well, the general, it's been very nice to listen to you again. Many of the points are very valid, and I share them. But I still have, and it goes back to the time that I was Secretary General of the Western European Union. Was the question? should we have started in Afghanistan? And because the only reason we did was Osama bin Laden, who was given shelter by the Afghanis. Uh, and that was the reason that we got involved more and more. Uh, well, I don't want to go too far in, into that now. But how do we get out of this situation that the United States has stopped policies in Afghanistan? Is this the time, perhaps, for the NATO and European Union countries to develop a more non-military uh, policy uh, which may be effective, because how, how else will the United States deal with Afghanistan in the future? Okay, I think that's a good question. Well, again, uh, thanks for the question, Secretary General. By the way, thanks to the two ambassadors and thanks to the others in the room who have uh, served your country and undoubtedly individuals with whom I had contact and uh, professional relationships over the year. And I should also have said up front what a privilege it was for me to serve with Dutch forces, uh, not just in Cold War Europe, but in Haiti, where I was the chief of operations for the United Nations mission, not dual-hatted with U.S. And the, the Dutch forces uh, in the southern part of Haiti were spectacular. In Bosnia, where Dutch forces were very, very impressive. In Iraq, where they were very, very impressive. In Samawa and so forth. And then on the uh, uh, NATO training mission, which I led as a three-star, and then obviously in Afghanistan, uh, in Aruzgan and, and in other areas. Um, again, you all should be very, very proud of your men and women who have worn your uniform, uh, but especially, uh, I think, in the last three or three decades or so with what they have done. Um, this really comes back to the question that we have discussed uh, already a couple of times about yeah. whether or not the EU can actually generate some kind of um, unilateral military capability. Certainly it can, and again, conceptually, that idea has some merit. Um, the reality, again, though, is what we saw in Afghanistan, that even though the uh, NATO forces had some 8,500, although they, they may have included some from out of NATO as well, even though there were 8,500, nearly three times the forces that the U.S. had, they could not remain in Afghanistan if the U.S. left. And that's because the U.S. was doing the high-end, sophisticated uh, enabling of Afghan forces, the advise, assist, and enable with a, an armada of drones, uh, close air support, precision munitions, intelligence fusion, and all the rest of that. And, and again, with great respect to the NATO partners with whom I've been privileged to 
soldier over the years, there is no corresponding capability in, uh, in any individual country. Again, a couple come close. The UK certainly has some very impressive intelligence fusion, some very impressive elements, but they are quite modest in size compared with what the US can bring to bear. The same is true of France and Germany and Italy. And then in a sense, you have uh, a number of other nations, again, which have quite modest capabilities. And it's hard to bring them all together because they're not constructed to be complementary of each other. They're constructed to give each country a little capability of this, 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 and this. And again, when you put them together, the whole is not always uh, greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so that's the challenge, I think, that the EU has. And again, it has confronted this. I'm sure, uh, Secretary General, that you recall earlier, you know, ESDI, I think it was, and I forget, you know, the European Security Defense Initiative it may have actually been the US one, but there are EU ones at various times and various constructs. But the, the reality is that the number of capabilities really never changed very dramatically. Uh, and so this is not a question of conceptual uh, constructs. This is a question of real capabilities that can be employed and also countries giving the authority uh, to a supranational entity uh, to actually employ those capabilities. And, and again, a uh, little bit of, again, wants to say, show me. Okay. I think that is a good topic for the next session. Or, or do, do you would like to answer this question? Uh, the, the, General, the policy, please. sure. The, you know, the policy for Afghanistan, first of all, we actually need to wait and see. Uh, we do need to see what is the character of governance of the Taliban. Will it be a kinder, gentler version uh, of its old self, or is it going to be a replay of what we saw in the mid-1990s to 2001, which is where it seems to be trending? And if it is trending in that direction, then the notions, the advocacy of Pakistan for recognition, I think, is, is quite misplaced. Um, I don't think you can recognize a government like that, nor should you, nor should you empower them, nor should you unfreeze their reserves and open up IMF special drawing rights and World Bank funds to them. Uh, and so they have a very bleak prospect and you will see continued, uh, again, a, a true humanitarian catastrophe uh, that will result in massive refugee flows, albeit much more difficult to get from Afghanistan to Western Europe and Central Europe than it is from Syria, but not impossible. Uh, and you will see a huge flow of individuals uh, out of the country trying to get somewhere with their families where they can achieve a better life for them. Okay. Uh, final question to you, General. Yes. Uh, when, we, uh, when we met last time, uh, I think it was in Brussels in 2017, you were mentioned for four posts in the Trump administration. So uh, the logical question is, uh, are you available for <laughs> a position in the Biden administration or in a new Trump administration? Um, you know, number one, I actually am truly non-political. I'm not, I don't register, I don't endorse candidates, I don't contribute and uh, I don't support. Um, and given my forthright, I, from my perspective, forthright assessment of issues such as Afghanistan, I seriously doubt that there is someone uh, in the West Wing of the White House who's <laughs> eager to have me join an administration, uh, which again, my family and I are very content uh, for that reality. Uh, I've been incredibly fortunate in my post-government life to be a partner in KKR, to be on have a variety of academic pursuits, to be a personal venture capitalist, to be on boards and to have a stimulating, uh, you know, rewarding, fulfilling set of endeavors. And uh, I'm in no hurry whatsoever to okay. alter that particular course. Let me share with you and the audience the words I remember from this interview and this session. I remember the words bruises. I remember the words rebalancing. I remember the word uh, complex relationship. And I remember the, the, your, ID, the, the, your, your quote, ideas have to be operationalized, talking about EU strategic autonomy. Um, these are words to think about um, because, um, yeah, this is a chaotic world in which um, 
big power competition is back. Uh, nobody can really predict how China and Russia d will deal with future American leadership and will deal mm -hmm. with a uh, European Union uh, searching for the ge ge geopolitical role on the, on the world stage. This all means that we need you back here, General, in the future for further analysis. I have no other famous last words than to thank you, General Petraeus, for sharing your time and insight with us. Please give the General a warm round of applause. Well, thank you so much, Robert. It really is a pleasure to be back with you and a privilege. And I very much look forward to being back in the, the old country. That is a term of endearment in my family, not a pejorative uh, term, uh, but it'll be wonderful to be back in the old country. And until then, free Slan Bapa. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, General Petraeus, and thank you okay. all here for being here, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.